This story is very emotional, showing the psychology of the killer. What's more surprising is that the police have no clues about the killer's identity at all. Will they find the real killer? Or will the police arrest the wrong person because they are too emotionally involved, leading to regret? How skilled is this killer? This story is very interesting to follow until the end. The film begins on New Year's Eve in the city of Baltimore, where the residents are having fun in anticipation of the new year. When the clock strikes 12, they all cheer together with many fireworks across the city. However, their cheers turn into screams of terror as, one by one, people in the city are shot and killed. From a seemingly unseen place in the city, a young female police officer named Eleanor Falco receives a call about a disturbance from a restaurant owner who wants a drunk customer removed from his restaurant. Eleanor gets an emergency call after arguing with the owner about the need to do that. She heads to the location of one of the shooting victims, trying to comfort the victim's wife and daughter before the police investigation begins. Eleanor and another officer investigate the crime scene and use a laser to estimate where the shot came from. They point to a specific apartment in a nearby building, but just as they are about to investigate further, the apartment suddenly explodes. They evacuate the building but Eleanor orders another officer to record the evacuating residents in case they can capture the face of the murderer. She then runs up the stairs through the smoke to see the other officers breaking down the apartment door. Eleanor tries to follow but faints near a window. She wakes up with a fellow officer placing an oxygen mask on her before paramedics take over. She tries to act okay but the paramedics insist she rest before going back down. Meanwhile, Detective Jack McKenzie who has helped Eleanor before informs the investigation leader about the identity of the apartment owner, a Norwegian who received the apartment as a debt payment and has never been there himself. Suddenly, a firework explodes nearby, startling all the officers before the city council informs them that they will turn off the remaining pre-programmed fireworks. Later, Eleanor sees a police dog barking at a toilet, which the leader also notices. He orders the team to take the entire toilet as evidence before telling Eleanor to leave the scene. The following day, Chief Jackson announces that Special Agent Lamarck from the FBI's Baltimore field office is joining the investigation as the leader who told Eleanor to leave the scene last night. Lamarck gives a speech to prepare the officers for the investigation they are about to launch. He says that the murderer who killed 29 people last night is a professional who does not want to get caught because he left no traces of his identity. However, they must not focus on common prejudices of mass murderers like Nazis or terrorists. Instead, they must remain open-minded because the killer is just another person on the fringes. Eleanor silently watches his speech, and then, while handing out some coffee, she hears Lamarck and Jesse Capleton from the governor's office arguing about closing the highway. It seems Capleton only cares about the governor's good image rather than catching the murderer. In the locker room, Eleanor is chatting with a fellow officer when she says that what the killer did was more like swatting a mosquito than being truly evil. Lamarck, overhearing this, asks why she thinks so. She explains that, based on her feelings, the killer is seeking relief rather than destruction and only stopped killing because he was satisfied for the night. However, she thinks the killer might do it again. Seemingly satisfied with her answer, Lamarck introduces himself before leaving. The next day, Eleanor receives a call from Chief Jackson saying that Lamarck wants to meet her at a cafe very soon. Hence, she rushes there to find the man arguing again with Capleton, who wants to keep the beach open despite a mass murderer on the loose. Again, his priority seems to be only the governor's success. After Capleton leaves, Eleanor joins Lamarck for coffee. Lamarck thinks Eleanor can solve the murder case well, either because she is a good detective or as crazy as the killers. Then Jack arrives and Lamarck reveals that he wants them to join his team for this investigation as liaisons between the Baltimore Police Department and Lamarck himself. The three of them go to the police station for a briefing with other investigative team members. The only clue then was to call the painters who had worked on the exploded apartment two years ago. Another member, Krupp, mentions that the anti-terrorism unit is conducting background checks at the request of Frank Grabber, another FBI agent. This angers Lamarck, who reminds the room that he is leading the operation and that everything must be approved by him. Then a woman brings documents for Lamarck to sign from Capleton about his approval to not enforce a curfew, which he actually disagrees with. However, he signs it. Marquin continues the briefing by informing that the weapon used was an antique N21 sniper rifle, which is older than the firearms database, causing another problem for the team. Helliner suggests that the building guards might lead them to another clue, so Lamarck orders the team to investigate. On the way to the morgue, Eleanor mentions that Lamarck seems upset about other teams joining, but Jack says it is expected because cases tend to derail when many teams are involved. At the morgue, the three of them are stunned to see the number of victims now right in front of them. Lamarck begins asking the two officers about their suspicions of the killer. 
They both think it is a man who has military training or high-level sports, but Eleanor believes the victims are a spontaneous decision because there is no pattern. Lemark also thinks that the killer is not seeking the suffering of others because all the victims were killed with one shot, so he must be trying to disrupt societal behavior. They are interrupted by an officer saying that they have found the killer, so they rush to the location where Agent Frank Grabber is leading the operation. He says they found a kid in the apartment building who refuses to be interrogated and threatens to kill everyone after locking himself in his room. Lamarck thinks this is a wrong move, especially since they are still determining if the kid even has a weapon. They watch the team break through the apartment door, and the kid throws things at them before breaking the window and jumping out. Lamarck is furious about the hasty decision made by Grabber and Capleton, who are still too proud to admit his mistake. At the office, Lamarck and the two officers start questioning the painters. One of them, Roddy Lang, brings his baby boy because his wife is at work. One by one, the painters are asked about their connection to the bombing and the killer, but it seems none of them know anything as they did the work several years ago. Meanwhile, Eleanor observes all the details from the painters to assess the situation. However, Lamarck asks her to take the baby outside because it's distracting. A little later, after Eleanor receives a lab report indicating that the killer is vegan, Lamarck approaches her and is angry because she didn't give him the report immediately. While walking home, Lamarck apologizes for getting mad at her and invites her to his house for dinner to discuss the new evidence. At first, she refuses, thinking Lamarck is just flirting with her, but he clarifies that he is married. In the car, Lamarck talks about how he feels constrained by Capleton because his influence could get Lamarck fired before they investigate the new evidence. However, Lamarck mentions that he knows Eleanor was rejected when applying to the FBI. Even though she thinks it doesn't matter, Lamarck says it does because they are under the scrutiny of both the FBI and the police department. Lamarck continues to press Eleanor about why she became a police officer, her honest answer during the FBI application, why she didn't go to college, and all other triggers until she breaks down and reveals the scars she caused herself. She is struggling with depression and Lamarck wants this to be her fuel in understanding the killer and getting more clues. A mysterious man steals someone's clothes at a mall, starts washing himself at a public restroom sink, and shamelessly collects leftover vegetables from the cafeteria tables. The security guards approach him, asking him to open his bag, but he refuses, saying he just wants to go home. After further insistence, the man pulls out a gun and starts shooting. Eleanor is at an antique weapons store for the investigation and is called to the scene. She arrives at the security room to join the others in an attempt to see the man's face, which they find impossible to do. Eleanor notices the man only taking vegetables from the tables, confirming the lab report they received yesterday about the killer. They then witness him killing the guards and a woman who mocked him before walking away and killing the officers arriving at the scene. Eleanor and Lamarck observe that the killer doesn't want to engage but also uses the gun as an extension of himself noting that he might have been born among skilled snipers. The killer also uses a grenade to blow up the officers chasing him outside the mall. Lamarck sees Capleton arriving by helicopter and immediately orders Eleanor and Jack to find the shirt the killer wore after encouraging the team leader. The officers go to the landfill where the mall's trash was previously dumped. They painstakingly search for the shirt by hand. Meanwhile, at the station, Grabber and Capleton have the idea to show footage of the killer on a popular TV show, hoping someone will recognize him. Lamarck thinks it's a bad idea but Lamarck's boss, Nathan Bowen, says he must go along with their decision or risk being fired. Shortly after Lamarck argues back, Jack arrives with the shirt they were looking for. The team examines the arsenal keeper's data. It receives a lab report that the killer may have suffered severe head trauma in the past. Finally, the mall footage is broadcast on TV and the host asks anyone who recognizes the killer to call into the show. People start calling for unrelated reasons until someone claims to be the killer and says he is part of the Shadow Army. The officers manage to trace the caller's location and rush there to apprehend him even though Lamarck and Eleanor believe he is not the real killer. The caller is at a corner store with his friends, and to prepare for the operation Jack, Marquan, and Eleanor evacuate all other civilians. Eleanor struggles to convince an old man to leave before the caller and his friends realize they are targets. A shootout ensues, killing most of the men except for one who other officers capture with a taser. Unfortunately, the captured man reveals that the call was just a prank gone wrong and that they had nothing to do with the killer or any shadow army. The next day, Lamarck is questioned at the station about the failed operation. He explains that it wasn't his idea and that he actually opposed it, but since he is the head of the operation, he has to approve every action and thus take the consequences. 
The television footage caused many civilian casualties even outside the failed operation. They then bring up Eleanor's failed FBI assessment to undermine her work, but Lamarck defends Eleanor, saying she has great potential. However, she still gets fired. In the end, Lamarck joins Eleanor and Jack for a drink. Feeling guilty, Eleanor goes home and struggles against the urge to hurt herself again. After showering and reflecting, she realizes something and heads to Rodney, the painter's house. She accuses Rodney of handing off his painting job to someone else because she analyzed his income records, which showed he took another job from a different company simultaneously. After being scolded by his wife, Rodney confesses the truth to Eleanor, accompanied by Lammer. He says he gave the painting job to a former convict named Dean. Dean told him he became vacant after working at a slaughterhouse in the South, so they bring in a sketch artist for Rodney to describe what Dean looks like. Before Lamarck and Eleanor head to the three slaughterhouses in the area, they take the sketch and ask people if they recognize the man who worked there some time ago until a woman identifies him as Dean Poss. She tells the police about how Dean was bullied while working there by a man who eventually fell into the meat grinder while on duty with Dean. Dean claimed the man slipped, but they all knew he did it. This was why he was sentenced to two years. In the car Eleanor reads Dean's info. She finds out that his father was a shooting instructor in the army who later became an arsenal keeper, explaining Dean's access to antique firearms. Dean also got head trauma in his childhood from a gunshot. They don't have his contact or address, but they stop by Dean's mother's house before heading out. Eleanor wants to call Jack for help, but Lamark says no because it might cause others to interfere and mess up their lead. Lamark leaves as another car stops behind them, driven by Mrs. Poss. She refuses to cooperate at first, but she invites them in after saying they can capture Dean alive. Mrs. Posse explains that after the shooting range accident where Jack was shot by his father, he became a recluse who hated the world. Dean received shooting training from his father, who wanted to secure a place for him in the army but wasn't accepted because he wasn't challenging then. Then Eleanor sees a nearby house, but it's too late as Lamarck is shot from that vacant house. Panicking, Eleanor orders Mrs. Posse to take their guns and phones to show Dean they are trying to help him. Mrs. Posse goes out into the yard and yells at Dean to stop, saying that if he doesn't go with Eleanor, then he should join her in heaven before she shoots herself in the head. Dean, who sees everything, approaches the house with his rifle. He enters, puts down his rifle, and takes a pistol before sitting in front of Eleanor. They start talking as Dean explains why he did what he did, and she tries to convince him that she can help because she is also struggling like him. In the end, Dean seems to trust Eleanor and wants her to shoot him after he falls asleep next to his mother, which Eleanor agrees to. Unfortunately, Dean hears police sirens and thinks Eleanor has betrayed him so he drags her to the shed and ties her to a post with cable ties while going back and forth, killing the arriving officers. Eleanor desperately tries to stop him with her words and struggles to free herself from the cable ties. She stops him and forces him to hug her as the officers surround the cabin, promising to get him the help he needs once he surrenders. But after he presses the button to detonate a bomb nearby, Eleanor bites his neck, causing him to lose blood. Dean manages to escape and points his gun at her but decides not to shoot and leaves. Eventually, the police find him sitting against a wall, weak and bleeding out before they shoot him multiple times. Meanwhile, Eleanor manages to free herself and is helped by Jack. Sometime later in Nathan Bowen's office, Eleanor is given documents to sign to keep the operation secret in exchange for an intelligence analyst position at the FBI. She refuses, saying her silence on their incompetence can't be bought. She mentions that what she did with Lamarck was illegal because they acted without authority, so Eleanor seems to be considering the offer. She wants Lamarck to be given a posthumous medal of valor, which Bowen agrees to. They agree that she also wants to become a special agent instead of an analyst. Finally, Eleanor shakes hands with Capleton before going home, reflecting on Lamarck's words. Thank you for watching.